Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have your attention, please. Uh, first of all, my name is Mark, and I'm introducing the uh, Sensing Health uh, Challenge for the day. And I would like to ask you whether you would, would like to come uh, to the front, because we are a small, small group, so uh, I'd like to have it intimate. Thank, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to address the agenda. Uh, we will have a presentation of uh, Jan van Erp, which, uh, who I will introduce uh, shortly. Uh, he will talk about 40 minutes uh, introducing the topic, and then I will give you some details on the, on the practicalities of the challenge. And then uh, if you're still interested in participating, then we'll, we'll have sort of a, of, a, of a session where we either formulate group or have a bit of more insight into Challenges, challenge actually is or what it entails and we will do that elsewhere but I will give you information on that later. So without further ado I would like to introduce uh, Professor Jan van Erp who is uh, and I have to uh, consult my uh, my phone for that because it's a uh, it's a mouthful. Sorry about that. <laughs> He's a principal scientist, perceptual and cognitive systems, and has a background in, uh, in biomedical uh, uh, psychology. Uh, and he's working uh, currently at TNO. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Jan. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I need my hand to uh, hold the microphone. Well, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I understand I'm stealing your lunch, probably. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here and probably also a pleasure if you really um, become an interactive audience because this is probably one of the smallest audiences um, I've addressed in the last 20 years. So um, let, let's make it fun. Um, to set something uh, straight, uh, I'm not going to introduce the challenges that will be um, Mark's duty later on. Um, Mark just asked me to give you a uh, bit out of the box talk. So that's what I will be doing. And um, it's going to be about cyborgs. So, again, my name is uh, Jan van Erp. I actually have two affiliations. My major affiliation is with TNO, the Dutch uh, R&D organization. But I also have a professorship at the University of Twente, also in Holland. And um, I believe that technology is here, here to um, support us, us in improving our performance, our well-being, or simply support us in our strife for happiness. And when I read your challenges, um, I thought, wow, what you are actually doing are, is working towards um, the next step in being human. And uh, you are actually working on cyborgs. So I decided that's a nice topic to talk about. And, um, to set the stage, I would like to start with a small uh, video. It's a trailer uh, from the BBC. Uh, they made that for a documentary called Beyond Human. Let's see if that works. Welcome to the age of cyborgs and androids. As humans become more machine-like and machines more human, the line between biology and technology is starting to blur. And in the process, we may just be reinventing the future of our species. So did you hear the last sentence? The guy said, we may be reinventing the future of our own species. That sounds uh, like a lot of crap, right? Um, but actually, there are quite some uh, respected uh, scientists who share that same idea. For example, Stephen Hawkins, 
who actually believes that humans have entered a new stage of evolution. And normally, if we talk about the next stage in our evolution, uh, we talk about cyborgs. Cyborgs stands for cybernetical organisms, and it actually means uh, an entity, a biological entity, that contains both biological elements as well as biomechatronic parts. Now, of course, uh, those biomechatronical parts, um, here you see an artist's impression of a cyborg, um, can both tap into um, our physical bodies, like our limbs, our hands, um, but also on um, the way we perceive the world and we think and behave. And what I would like to do today is um, take you back in the history of cyborgs and see if we can distill the truths, if we can predict the future. What this technology actually might bring us and maybe your challenge will actually contribute to that. Uh, because cyborgs are around for a long time, they're not new. On the contrary, this guy, Guts von Berlichen, um, lost his arm in a, in a fight, in a duel, and he ordered his local blacksmith to make his, this iron hand for him. And he could, could control the iron hand by different wires. So actually, this is a cyborg, right? It's both human biological parts as well as um, biomechatronical parts. And mind you, this is more than 500 years ago. This is also the start of a long history of uh, cyborg technology uh, focused on restoring functions. And of course, it's a bit more advanced than 500 years ago, but the principle is still the same. If you're missing a leg or uh, a hand, can we restore that function by coupling your body to biomechatronical parts? Um, so that was kind of the cyborg technology up till a couple of decades ago. Um, Interestingly, um, one of the more challenging questions is should we also only focus on restore or also focus on enhancing performance? Um, and that's actually one of the first transition of cyborg technology. Uh, one could think about uh, all kind of uh, exoskeletons that might improve your uh, endurance, your strength, um, your precision. Um, another interesting question is um, if you're not missing a leg but imagine you walk faster with a biomechatronical part, would you be willing to ampute your leg and replace that by a robot leg? Sounds like a stupid question but people do strange things to their bodies and um, another part um, and those people are known also as body modifiers. Um, people do things to their body just because it's beautiful, because they like it. Um, so this is also a form of cyborg technology, uh, but it is definitely not restoring function, right? Okay, um, there's another transition going on, and that is that we are not only developing technology um, that we put outside of your body, uh, but of course also inside your body. Uh, think about pacemakers, uh, insulin pumps, uh, cochlear implants. Um, so that is kind of the second transi transition from that ages old um, restoring limbs to restoring functions of your internal organs. And of course, if we look at this kind of technology, you can ask the same question. Uh, would people be willing to implant cyborg technology if they're perfectly healthy? And again, I think most of you would say no. Who would be stupid enough to do that? Uh, but of course, the answer is yes. And this is just an example of um, uh, something, probably a stunt, but still very, very real, uh, of the Baia Beach Club. That's a discotheque in, in uh, Barcelona, but also in Rotterdam, here in Holland. So you can visit it uh, this weekend if you would like to. And about uh, 10, 15 years ago, you could actually get an RFID chip implanted in your upper arm, uh, which would grant you access to the club. Uh, you could use that to pay. And of course, that's very convenient. So if you want to go out dancing, you don't have to carry your purse. You just swipe your arm and you're in and you pay. Uh, and people do that. You know? 
So yes, enhance, of course, this is not restoring function, but again, pure enhancement. Um, of course, that is all relatively simple technology, right? An RFID chip is still passive. It doesn't really affect the way we perceive the world or the way we think. Um, but there's more technology out there that actually does. Uh, and I give you two examples. One is, again, from the body modifier community. Um, people implanting little magnets in their fingertips, uh, which actually mean that they can, for example, feel electric wiring in the walls. Um, so is it passive? Yes. But on the other hand, it directly affects the way we perceive the world around us. A more advanced example uh, is the bionic ear. Uh, developed in, the, in Princeton, and that is actually printed from a uh, biomechanical, a uh, biocompatible material, um, but with electronics embedded. And these electronics, for example, can pick up uh, sound frequencies that are way uh, outside the frequency range we can hear as normal people. So if you have a bionic ear like this, you would be able to hear things that normal people would not be able to hear. So that would definitely change the way you perceive the world around you and the way you build your mental image of the world. Um, and of course, this is a topic that both fascinates and scares us, right? And uh, that's also why it's so popular in, in Hollywood. And you see a lot of movies um, in which we, the, 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 the people from Hollywood try to sketch uh, an image of our future um, in which not only part, but our full senses are only fed by digital signals. So it's not really restoring, it's not enhancing, it's complete um, involvement in just digital communication. And that scares us because deep inside there is kind of an image that this will all end um, in a situation where machines enslave humans. And that is built not only because Machines are much stronger, have a longer endurance than we have, but also because they become smarter than us. And um, the moment artificial intelligence will actually surpass human intelligence uh, is called singularity. And a lot of uh, visionaries um, like Ray Kurzweil, currently at Google, they predict that the moment of singularity is near. Well. Ray has done so for the last 20 years, but still, the moment is near. Um, I don't think it is, um, but of course, there are a lot of accomplishments over the past two decades that really show the progress we make in artificial intelligence. And of course, it all started more or less in, uh, well, let's say 20 years ago, when Deep Blue uh, defeated the world champion chess player. And that shocked the world, right? because that would mean that computers are smarter than people, and this is the end of humanity as we know it. Another accomplishment about 10 years ago, uh, again from IBM, uh, about five years ago, I must say, uh, Watson, who uh, played Jeopardy and could beat the best Jeopardy human players. And not so long ago, only a couple of months, in I think it was February this year, um, the final thing we were really, the final game, we were really excellent in as humans and would never be able to play it well by a computer was the game of Go. And Google this time, DeepMind, defeated the world champion Go player just a couple of months ago. Does that really mean that computers are smarter than humans? No, it really means that they are very, very good in one single task, right? So um, AlphaGo can play Go, but it cannot uh, walk through uh, a crowded uh, bus station and find its way uh, without bumping into people or read your facial expression. Uh, things we do continuously and without any trouble. More important, I think, it's not a question, it's not a competition. Who is smarter? Is that the computer or are we still smarter? That's not actually not a relevant question. Um, and another visionary, sorry, I'll skip this. Another visionary, uh, Vern Ving, actually said the following. Um, the most brilliant entities on the planet 
are average brain people, people like you and me, who are really good at blending their smarts with computer smarts. So it's not a competition, it is a symbiosis. Can we somehow come to a situation where we can uh, blend our human intelligence with computer smartness? And if we are successful, then we will become the most brilliant entities, symbiotic entities in this world. What it actually means is that we have to open our minds and our brains uh, to computer technology. And that is exactly what you see going on right now. And I'm slowly moving towards one of your challenges. Um, you see all those kind of devices um, out there. And the last transition in cyborg technology is that um, we're not only messing with our body, but also with our minds. And devices like this, you can just you know, buy on a consumer market for a couple of hundred euros. Um, they actually claim um, that they improve your health that they can support you in your artistic expression, um, that they can read your mind, that they can read your emotions. And that, of course, is quite relevant if we're talking about your health challenges. Um, so, for example, if we are able to measure your emotions or your emotional state or your stress state, that's the first step in developing um, technology support tools that can actually learn um, how to manage or how to cope with your emotions. And we know that, for example, stress has a strong relationship to um, obesitas or uh, diabetes. So without scaring you any further and hopefully within the time limits, I would like to talk about measuring emotional states with technology like this or actually more technology like this. And how can we come from devices like this to actually uh, measuring your emotional state? Well, of course, it all has to do with your brain. Um, so let's start with your brain. And the plan for the last 10 minutes is to take you on a tour through the human brain and see if these devices are actually able to measure something like emotional state. OK, let's start with the brain. I, Sometimes I feel, um, as, a, as a brain researcher, like the surgeons must have feel, felt like 400 years ago in the times of Rembrandt. Um, our brain is by far the most complex and fascinating things we have on Earth. And what does, why is the brain so complex? Uh, well, first of all, it, it, it's the numbers, right? The human brain, the average human brain contains about 80 billion neurons. That means 80 billion little calculation machines that can subtract and um, um, add. And 80 billion is already a large number, but each of those individual neurons are connected to many, many others, some up to 10,000 10, other neurons. Now, that sounds like a, a recipe for chaos, right? But fortunately, that is not the case. So uh, the human brain is, um, this should be an animation, but the human brain is um, neatly organized in different brain areas. Uh, and also the connections between those different brain areas are all relatively uh, logical ordered. So uh, an important way to look at the brain is look at different brain areas. And one perspective one could take is, uh, the perspective of evolution. So evolution simply stacked newer brain areas on top of older ones. So the human brain still contact, co uh, contains uh, an old reptilian brain. Yes, you too, you too, me too. We all have a reptilian brain inside. Uh, on, on top of that, more the mammalian brain, the limbic system. Uh, and on top of that, of course, the, the ape, the monkey, and the human brain. So this is only one perspective. Um, I told you we would speak about emotion. So another way to look at the brain is look at the emotional brain and see what kind of areas are involved in uh, processing emotions or emotional stimuli. Um, and this is a complex picture, but there are only two areas that 
of major importance if we talk about processing emotions. One of them is the uh, amygdala. I am sure you've heard about it. That's part of our limbic system buried deep inside our brain and kind of the um, threat detector of the brain. And the second part that is crucial is our prefrontal cortex, uh, typical human part of our brain right behind our forehead. And uh, the prefrontal cortex is more kind of our cognitive control center. Now, what, how does the brain process um, emotional stimuli? Like this one. Well, first thing is that um, a part of the sensory information that enters the brain has a shortcut directly to, the, to our amygdala. And as soon as there is a threat or another emotional stimuli, the amygdala prepares, detects it. It's the threat detector. Um, but it also prepares our body for action. So that means you have to fight. You have to run or to puke. Uh, and the uh, amygdala does so by releasing uh, stress hormones or hormones um, that increase our heart rate that uh, ensures that more blood is pumped to our muscles and our lungs, so more oxygen is uh, going through our muscles as well, all, you know, making the body ready for action. But amygdala activity is not the same as experiencing an emotion. Interpreting an emotion is done by our prefrontal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex takes into account uh, the situation, uh, prior experiences, uh, and that's, uh, for example, exactly the reason why you would and should run away from this lion, but not from this one. So your amygdala might say, this is a lion, run, but your prefrontal cortex says, no, it's in a zoo and it's locked behind bars. There is no danger here. Now, of course, the big question is, if we're talking about um, all those new gadgets that can measure your brain activity, can we somehow tap into the emotional brain? Uh, and the answer is yes and no. Um, if we look at uh, the amygdala, the answer is no. I told you that the amygdala is buried deep inside our brain and there's no way we can measure amygdala activity by putting some electrodes on top of your head, especially not if you're talking about uh, consumer electronics. The flip side, however, of amygdala activity is that uh, we can measure peripheral effects like heart rate, uh, like respiration rate, like blood pressure, uh, like pupil size, because I told you there are a lot of peripheral effects that are the direct and indirect uh, consequence of amygdala activity. So if we use um, uh, all kinds of physiological sensors, not on our, not measuring brain activity, but peripheral neurophysiological effects, we might get an indication of amygdala activity. The story is a bit different for the prefrontal cortex. Um, the prefrontal cortex um, does not really uh, result in peripheral effects, but is not deep, deeply inside our brain. It's quite uh, on the surface of our brain here on, behind our forehead. So indeed, we are able to measure prefrontal cortex activity. And of course, one of the big challenges then is to link prefrontal cortex activity to emotion. So which pattern corresponds to which emotion? And that is probably one of the challenges that is of interest to you as well. And we know a little about that. For example, we know that uh, there is an asymmetry between left and right prefrontal cortex activity with negative emotions uh, leading to more activation in the left prefrontal cortex and positive emotions in your right prefrontal cortex. We also know that it's not the case that the brain has distinct representations of distinct emotions. So there's not something like a happy neuron or a sad neuron or a, a distracted neuron. Um, so how do we solve that? One of the solutions is uh, not to map, to look at individual distinct emotions, but somehow map them in a multidimensional space. Uh, and this is one of the more uh, well-known examples with two axes, so it's only two-dimensional. Um, on the left, right, the horizontal axis, you find something like valence with the negative emotions ordered on the left side and the positive emotions on the right side. And on the vertical axis, you see something like arousal. 
with low arousal on this side and high arousal on the top side. So this is, is nicknamed the valence arousal plot. And we can quite consistently plot emotions in this two-dimensional two -dimensional model. Um, what also pops up to mind is that somehow valence might correlate to prefrontal activity. So I told you about the asymmetry between left and right and positive and negative emotions. And that might well correlate with the horizontal axis here. I also told you that amygdala activity is reflected in um, peripheral effects like increased heart rate, increased respiration uh, rate, and that might well correspond to the vertical axis in this model with low arousal, low amygdala activity on the lower side and high arousal, high amygdala activity um, on the up, uh, upper side. This is also the reason why I think that if you would like to do something with stress measurements or emotional state uh, detection, you should not look at the brain or heart rate in isolation. Then you get only part of this picture. So um, if you come to our lab as a, as a human uh, participant, human subject, um, we will all, always measure your brain activity, but also your heart rate. Um, your skin conductance saying something about the amount of sweating also related to amygdala activity, etc. Okay, I think uh, my time is about up. Um, and then of course the big challenge is making this step and then saying something about your emotional state. Um, time for me to wrap up. I uh, started by saying that you and me and other people are working towards cyborg technology that goes way beyond um, restoring uh, lost functions. Um, I talked about machines getting smarter and machines outsmarting us in um, isolated tasks. Um, I've sketched a horror image about machines taking over because they're stronger, they're smarter. Um, I've also told you that I don't believe in that story. Um, but I believe in symbiosis, in blending uh, our strong points with those of the machine. And uh, if we're talking about cyborg technology or robotic technology or neurophysiological technology, I think as humans, what we will do is what we do with all kind of technology, make sure that we get better. And that's kind of my uh, final slide. Um, for those who have questions, maybe we have time. Um, Otherwise, you can send me an email. Here's my email address. Uh, and having said that, good luck with your challenge, and thanks for your attention. We have time for a couple of questions. No. We have time for one or two questions if they are, if they are there. So, no questions for Jan? So, okay, then uh, I would like to uh, thank Jan uh, for, his, uh, for your nice overview. And I think it, uh, the story that you told uh, fairly sets the stage for, uh, for the actual challenge that we formulated. Um, so I will address that in a moment. So. So um, to, to just briefly touch upon the, uh, the background I, I have is that I've, I've done my PhD in uh, immunology and then moved into toxicology. And then from that, I moved into data science, so, or I'm moving into data science, to, uh, to be honest. Uh, and from, from that perspective, so with a lot of background in, in biology and physiology, I moved, I, I moved toward the, the, the idea that you could and it's not a new idea, of course. There are many applications that use uh, data on biology, on physiology, in order to prevent or maybe to diagnose a certain disease state. And if you think of uh, applications like, for example, uh, apps that, that Google or, uh, or uh, Apple has uh, that you can pre-install on your or smartphone and that could track or record, uh, the amount of calories, for example, that you that you take in, it's very it's a, it's a bit of a complicated uh, thing because you have to like 
You have to, to, to keep track of all the things you eat and then put it into the app and the app will tell you how, how much calories you've, you've consumed and then you can either decide on, on reducing your intake the next day or maybe increase it if you want to gain a, a, gain a pound or two. But it's still complicated. It does, it's a system that doesn't think for itself and it doesn't re register uh, certain, uh, certain data. And that's why, that's why we formulated this challenge. So we wanted to, uh, to address a certain uh, clinical or maybe health issue that could be solved by either introducing a new form of, of app technology that could record certain things that are going on in your body uh, and maybe integrate a new sensor technology in the same time at the same time so moving away from the sort of uh, uh, implicated oh it's not ah okay um, so moving away from uh, from this uh, this image uh, where you have uh, where you have a, 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 a sensor that records something and and uh, has only one basic feature uh, of which it records. We want to have a, a complete overview of, of what's going on in, in terms of physiology and in terms of perturbation of the, uh, of the disease so that we can either prevent it or take steps to, uh, to uh, uh, prevent uh, it from, uh, from escalating. Um, so, and uh, that takes me to the, to the challenge uh, where we, we want to uh, uh, have a way of integrating biomarkers into the modern uh, technology that is available to us. And for those of you who, who do not know what biomarkers are, biomarkers are basically all types of biomolecular molecules that you can measure that say something about what's going on inside of the body. Uh, so you could think uh, uh, about proteins or metabolites or, uh, as Jan addressed, uh, stress hormones or maybe uh, things that you can measure in the blood or have a scan of the brain and, uh, and, and see perturbations in the brain that, that, could have that, that are indications of disease. So th those, those are basically biomarkers that we are currently using in the clinic to diagnose uh, disease. But we want to have those biomarkers integrated into... Uh, for example, uh, app technology or maybe sensors or maybe wearables in a smartphone or, uh, or a watch or whatever. And that's a, that's a challenge because it, uh, most of the time you have to have an invasive uh, technology, yeah, take blood, uh, measure something uh, to, to, to address that particular biomarker. So that's the challenge that I want to, uh, uh, that I want to address in this uh, during the, the, the next two days. So in, in that uh, respect, we want to solve a prominent medical issue, and we want to use open data for that. And uh, in order to help us with that, we will we'll introduce a platform. Uh, this afternoon, we, uh, we have another talk uh, at 4, uh, 4 p.m., where we will introduce the Ontoforce uh, system. And the Ontoforce system is a, is a semantic tool, which means that it collects data, collects uh, published data, scientific data, and uh, gives you an output. Uh, so if you want to, for example, uh, search for all the known biomarkers on uh, diabetes, uh, you could use this uh, uh, Ontoforce tool, the semantic tool, to get an idea of what the biology behind that, that certain biomarker is. And then you can try to translate that to, uh, to, a, to a sense of technology. So we will hear more about that uh, this afternoon in uh, uh, by the tech, uh, by the, uh, in the technology lecture. And then uh, tomorrow morning we will ask the participants to have their first pitch ready. So and a pitch is about a seven minute presentation where you will, will, where you will pitch your initial idea. Pitch what, what you have, have uh, gathered on information and, and pitch the, the, the basic uh, prototype that you want to design with your group or with, with your, uh, uh, what idea would you like to have or, or generate or solve or prototype that, that will address this, uh, this particular challenge? And then, on, and then you will get the whole day to work on this, uh, on this particular challenge, and then you will get feedback from the jury and from the coaches. Uh, and then on Saturday, we will have uh, the second pitches, which is the final pitch, and then we will decide who, who has the best idea. And the, the group or either the, per, the person that, uh, that has the best idea will get a... Uh, Raspberry Pi 3. So that's the award.
Um, so we have, and I, I don't have time to, to address them all, but we have a, uh, pre-selected cases for you that, that will help you to, to focus your, your thinking and focus your, uh, your effort. Um, so the, 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 the four cases are, uh, and I'm not going into the details because I don't have the time, but the, the first case is on obesity. And the idea is to have either a tool, web-based or sensor, that can be built into a wearable that can measure metabolites associated with met metabolic disease. The second is on melanoma, which is a currently uh, increasing problem in the, in the Western society where we have both over and underdiagnosed uh, melanoma. So either uh, melanoma is, uh, is overdiagnosed by, uh, by the physician and removed, or it's underdiagnosed because of people don't recognizing uh, a certain patch on their skin as being uh, a possible melanoma. So that, that could be uh, also a, a nice challenge um, to develop a tool or maybe a sensor that could recognize on the basis of an image or either a, a physiological characteristic of the skin uh, and be built into a watch or to in, into a smartphone um, addressing this, this particular clinical problem. Uh, the, the, the third is about uh, genetic var variants and uh, this is really a hackathon. So uh, there's, uh, there's data available on, uh, on, uh, on genetic differentiation in the population and we, we ask you to, to, to get it uh, to, uh, to address this question. Uh, and the fourth is also on human skin disease, but more based on, on uh, photographs. So you could imagine that you, you would take a photograph of a certain uh, patch of skin, for example, rash or even melanoma, and then send it to the physician, and, uh, and it gets uh, analyzed by a certain image algorithm, and then it, uh, you will get uh, the results back, whether it's a, 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 a threatening uh, alarming patch that you have need to be, uh, investigate further or whether you can just uh, leave it at that. So machine learning could be uh, a thing here to, uh, to, to involve. Uh, as I said, Ontoforce will get you uh, updated on that platform uh, this afternoon. Uh, so we'll, we will have also login uh, uh, available for the platform if you send an email to uh, to uh, uh, to this address, then I will, uh, I will be certain it's, uh, to have a login for you. But we will have more on that uh, later on. So we also have uh, a couple of coaches that will be, will be available either via email or on site. You have to arrange for an appointment if you want to uh, speak to them to get more d uh, detailed information on the biology behind some of the cases. Um, so be sure to note this uh, email. And then uh, uh, especially important, if you, if you want to participate and you want to present in a, a pitch, be sure to contact uh, the coaches and, and, get, and give them feedback also on the slides that you're preparing so that you can have a back and forth uh, uh, with the coaches. So uh, this is the award and that's uh, my final slide. Uh, because we're not so many people, I want to uh, 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 ask you to think about whether you want to participate. And if you want to, then I will suggest to follow me after this presentation. I have, and, and I have a special ga uh, uh, gadget for that. You can follow the, the, the green lightsaber. Uh, I will take it along with me uh, to the region uh, pavilion. So the Utrecht region pavilion is where we will meet after this, uh, this session. And then we'll take about uh, 45 minutes, an hour or so, to just go into detail on the challenge and to formulate groups if, we, if, if necessary. So uh, uh, please consider whether you want to participate. If you want to, then follow me afterwards, and then uh, uh, I would like to give you uh, more details. Th and thank you for the attention. <laughs>